um, exercise for the morning, right? So you all stand up. All stand up, right? You can move a little bit, get some energy into your brain. Now think about your organization and specifically the way of those HR practices like recruiting, how is it done? And uh, performance reviews. And Right? <laughs> and uh, on onboarding and goals and objectives and things like that, right? All those in your kind of image. And then if those makes you unhappy, you can sit down. <laughs> <laughs> are good and you know it's not unhappy that's too bad but some of those are good but I'm not like super excited about it you can sit down <laughs> now we have three people who are super excited about that congratulations <laughs> exactly you have lots as well no we're a very small company okay um, I'm for more responsible for the transformation of the half like teams. Okay. We're asking about that. Perfect. So, thank you very much. You can sit down and have to stand for the entire presentation. I just want to get the sounds. So, that's the background, right? I was quite unhappy about the way how we do things at the organization where I work. And that actually move me into saying when our, you know, we've got these different, different owners coming in and they've been having those conversations with all those employees who's been there for a while. What would you like to change? What would you do differently? What is your dream for this organization? Those type of things, right? And I was doing my MBA at that time, so I was like plenty of like, you know, those frameworks and ideas and big names in my mind. So I've been just pushing them all those ideas, and then I did one pragmatic kind of decision. And I thought, they would never give me any department, because they have those managers for those departments of testers, developers. I can't get the answers, I don't have a one. <laughs> 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 Sorry. So, they would never give me any of those departments. So I thought like, hey, what is missing in this organization? Completely, like no one is doing it. I said, hey, HR, well that's nice. I would love to change that. Not do it this way, but change it completely. So I said, hey, and I would like to do this, you know, change this HR and to be more, you know, culture supportive and help employees to be more motivated and blah, blah, blah. I don't even remember what I said. And then I forget. And then three months after, they came back to me and said, so by the way, we thought with this board here, very formal meeting, by the way, we think with this board that you would be great at our engineering director, you can take over three departments, developers, testers, and hardware guys, and build one kind of very flexible place where they can collaborate and you know, support our customers' needs. And so, wow. And then he continued and said, and by the way, you asked for HR, so you can have it as well. <laughs> so we have it as well. So that's the beginning of my story, how I get there. It was actually a nice coincidence, because having that huge department and HR, you can transform the organization into something which I would nowadays call agile organization in like no time, because you don't have to fight with anyone pretty much except our owners, and they've been pretty much supporting whatever I said at their time, because when they just choose you, they don't say no to your first idea. So they've been asking some questions, but at the end of the day, they always said yes. And that was interesting. I know a little bit of background of myself. Now, what is this change about? And now I'm speaking about the change in organization, shifting towards agile organization, right? So a few things really fast. We're speaking about moving from fixed hierarchy to next fork. But this 
flexible structure, right? It's collaborative, creative, adaptive network. So we took this org chart. It's not that boring as you usually see it, but that's the same hierarchical thing. And we kind of take it, unwire it, and create that sphere, right? Which is, by the way, not fixed, because it's constantly moving somehow. Like a boat on a sea, right? So that is what it is. We might not even have any org chart, because in the moment say us, in my case, 10 years ago, it's yeah, there is this direct rule level, and then there are those cross functional self organizing teams. That's it. Right? So the org chart was kind of useless. And it was changing because the team's been changing, we've been learning a lot, practice has been changing, but the whole thing goes beyond applying Scrum, applying Kanban. That's a very different space what I'm speaking right now about. So just to link it somewhere. Now another shift which is happening in that transition, right, is from individuals to teams. If you think about it, that's exactly what we did while you first implement your Scrum, Canon, whatever, or X3 programming, by the way. You just say it's not about managing individuals, it's actually about growing teams. That makes a whole difference. System focus, right? And then, one of my favorite, from fixed annual cycles. Every year you have your anniversary for your, you know, being part of the company. We have this performance review, very motivating. <laughs> Etc. Some people looking forward to it, most people hate it in a way. And we exchange it for some flexible ongoing conversation. We just don't do those things only annually, every January 15. It's so unique. I mean, you can still celebrate it. I would love to see every employee getting a present at the work anniversary. It could be a cake, it could be a flower, it could be a chocolate, it could be a voucher to. I don't know, what's the most favorite store here in Austria? The what? Kassen und what? <laughs> <laughs> that one, right? It could be anything. <laughs> Bad idea to ask about it. <laughs> so it could be anything. Just celebrate, right? But split it away from Kita. I need a cycle. There is so many things happening during that year. Ridiculous. Now, last one from defined structures. Kind of purpose driven dynamic structures. So I don't know, how many of you hear about teal organizations? Just to get a sense. A few of you. That's a concept from reinventing organizations. Great book. The rest of you can check it. But it pretty much says we don't have a fixed structure. It's a liquid structure where we only talk about, okay, I see a problem, so I solve it. It's like application of this, from a mind's perspective, of this flotilla of the small boats, right? Instead of big tanker boat with a captain on the top <laughs> giving the orders, you have this flotilla of the small boats. They have the same Vision, the same purpose, the same star on horizon. They do. Otherwise, they would go to the random directions and it would be completely chaotic mess. But with that purpose in mind, they make day to day, minute by minute, decentralized, autonomous decisions. So that's exactly what we are aiming for. It is actually not driven by the structure anymore. The organization doesn't make a decision according to any structure. It's actually purpose driven. And that's the hardest one. Because how many of your organization have such an important and strong enough purpose? So you actually, one of the many tests that you can ask yourself is how many of 
you would be coming back to work tomorrow if out of nowhere, right now, I'm telling you, you get your money, including the bonus, exactly the same, no matter if you go there tomorrow or not. How many of you would be keep going? The organization, eh? Not a surprise there. <laughs> right? Some of you, that's a good ratio, by the way. Right? Good ratio. It will bring you coming back to work, even if you don't have to come. You just make that decision, right? For me, purpose. If there is some higher vision to achieve. One of the reasons why I am with the Scrum Alliance and not some other certifying whatever businesses is because they have this vision, we transform the world of work. And you can do it in many different ways. We have quite a huge autonomy in achieving that. But that vision, to have this sustainable agility to help the other companies, it's appealing to me. It doesn't have to be appealing to you, that's fine, right? But for me, that's the reason why I spend a lot of time with my friends from Scrum Alliance, helping them to figure that out. So, purpose, right? If you have it, it unifies you, and you don't need that structure. But here's the downside. If you don't have it strong enough, and you get rid of that traditional structure because you say, hey, structure is not agile, she just said so, you're going to get a mess and complete chaos, and you're going to fail quite badly. So keep that in mind. All those practices we might start talking about from now have always certain context. If you do them in a very hierarchical, traditional organization with like no purpose at all, I don't think they're going to work. They do more bad than good. Now, in one work, what we really do is Agile, we optimize the organization for adaptiveness. So now, four steps. How can HR help organizations to change the mindset? Because at the end of the day, it's all about mindset. Yeah, most favorite word, anyway. No one knows what it is. So, from internal process support to employee experience focus. So that was exactly what I hated on our HR processes. That they've been actually legal oriented. They only care about some regulations <coughs> and what you can do and what we should restrict our people from doing. And then, I have this dream that yeah, we really care about every single person who is coming to our company and help them to be successful and to be part of this family thing, right? So we truly care about each of them and get a frequent feedback from the people and try to improve their overall employee experience. And you can see it in every single process, which I mentioned at the beginning, right? Now, there's the second one. It's like from really the regulations world to the culture builders. Similar to the previous one, but uh, it's really, I believe, that at the end of the day, HR doesn't need to care about those regulations. They are unimportant. They will not help your organization to be successful. But how you can help your organization actually to be successful is to support that culture shift. So, and now, I don't think HR is starting the Agile transformation. The HR helps the Agile transformation which is already running to make it successful, right? The culture will always follow how the people are acting, so you can't really build it from scratch. But once your organization is on that journey, that's where you're needed at the HR. Now, a few things. Positivity. Is this glass half full or half empty? How many of you believe it's half empty? 
this too, good. How many of you believe it's half full? Ah, you too as well, huh? You're smart. So, I show it at one of my classes and there was this agile coach and saying like, hey, I disagree. It's not either half full, half empty, it's actually full. And I look at him, like, full, oh, really? Like, are we looking at the same glass? And he was saying, well, you know what? It's half full of water and half full of air. So that's the true positivity. It's just a matter of perspective. And I'm from Prague, Czech Republic, and we are pretty negative, I would say. So if I do that test in Czech, I got like that empty glass <laughs> for at least half of the people. Because to me, that was clearly not full, right? It's just a matter of perspective. Now, how the positivity can help you is there was this research of a gentleman here, research couples. And he was saying that he can predict if the couple is going to stay together or if they're going to break up after a short conversation with them. And he got quite good results with his prediction. And he then shared how he do it. And he said uh, he's just counting the number of positive versus negative events in that conversation between those two people. And he said if you're gonna stay together, you have for every five or every one negative, you have five positives. That's the ratio if you wanna stay together. Then he repeated it for the teams, the ratio and businesses. And the ratio was pretty much the same. If it was supposed to be a successful team, five positive to one negative event. Now, how many of you have retrospective as complaining session? No one I hope, right? Yeah, well, I don't know if you want this back. There's the negativity, negativity, negativity. What is positive? Nothing, I guess, right? I've been there as well. So, we try to balance it, right, at the retrospective. We try to shift it towards those positive events, like, okay, okay, yeah, those things are happening. But what are you going to do differently next time, right? So, this type of thing. And it starts with actually raising awareness about things. So, as simple as that, measure the engagement. Right? How do people feel about the culture and the organization? And you can find several templates for engagement surveys. And I don't think those questions matter that much. But once you start asking us, you actually have an input for internal retrospective for the team, for the organization, I mean. Like, what are we going to do about it? People feel they are not appreciated. Wow. They thought they are doing that much for that. And they still feel they are not appreciated. Oh, interesting. So that's the first step, actually, again, the awareness about how people feel about different things, right? Because if you don't know about it, and the organization is not aware of it, you can't really change it. Then, go and see. It's one of those interesting, very agile principles which also those people who are grounded in this legal background, they hate it because they say, no, 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 no. You can't invite anybody from outside to go and see how we do our scrum. So I remember a couple years ago, I got this idea, you know. I'm running a Czech community. I've been doing a lot of uh, like coaching around the company. So I said, hey guys, if you want, I will connect you together and you just self-organize into those Scrum Master visits. Right? So if you're interested, sign up with me. Then I do the initial call, put you together and you can visit each other and spend a week at this company as a guest Scrum Master and then they go to your company, etc. From legal perspective, you sort it out. Just sign an NDA, right? Not a big deal. And I've got about 10 companies interested their Scrum Masters, and about half of them haven't been able to figure out the legal aspect, so they gave up. 
about five of them may mostly like two agree, then two agree, then two agree, and they learn a lot, right? So go and see. And it starts from internal company, right? You have one team, another team, another team, go and see how they do, whatever practice. How come they have such a short daily scrums? How their board looks like? What is their retrospective about? Ask for permission, but you know, if you're a nice person in general, and they ask you, hey, don't share what we talk about here. Yes, no problem, it's all, right? So that's the first level. The second level is invite those companies and share and go somewhere and see. And the third level is actually start educating the others. So, um, in most of the countries nowadays in Europe, you will see some agile community, usually more people, already running. So join them. Or start your own, which is focused on product ownership. Or start your own, which is focused on gaming. Because that's what your passion is about. And start to share at the conferences like this. That's our journey, that's what we did. Show up at those other conferences for your open space and ask people for feedback. Hey, that's what we do. What do you think so about it? So this is this sharing thing. And through that sharing, you learn, you inspect and adapt, you change your way of working, etc., etc. Et but it's very open, inclusive. And as I just said, open and inclusive. So we start to have a very different type of meetings. We try to call them workshops to distinguish. But actually a meeting, in my mind, has a leader, a manager, a person who drives it, who is responsible. I'm running this meeting and that's what we're gonna do. Those workshops, on the other hand, they might not have it. They might have a topic. So we have this, you know, engagement survey some time ago and this was this biggest issue whoever wants to join you're free to join friday 10 a.m we're gonna talk have a coffee biscuits and talk about how we can improve it at this organization completely inclusive completely want your best and the concepts like uh, open space which i'm going to talk about later are exactly where you need to be so, there was this where to go, right? Now, <coughs> where not? What are the practices you should avoid? In general, this one. Carrot and stick. Yeah, everybody had that type of reaction, right? We know that this is not the right practice. And now, in how many companies you have those bonuses? If you achieve that, we give you this. And by the way, if you don't, you lose your bonus. What else is this? <laughs> Just a carrot and stick. If you do, then. If you don't, then. And if you have those things, we're going to give you a better position. Same thing. It's completely unrelated the best next, to the value. So the second thing, as you might already guess, for our developers, we used to have seven levels of which you can achieve as a software developer. I can't name them anymore. It was like junior software developer and software developer and software designer and software architect and senior whatever and uh, it was a mess. No one really knows how they are structured by the name. It was like so many, so we didn't really use them anyway. So what I did, we actually get rid of them. We were not ready to get rid of titles at all, at large scale, because our owners felt, no, no, I have this director, and she's responsible for everything, and I said, yes, no problem, right? I was kind of this shield for his traditional view. But below that, we just say, we have roles, so you can become a Scrum Master. But we didn't have a position of Scrum Master, by the way. And you might have some other roles, like being a product owner, or being a team member. 
but that was about it. And it's hard to sell to the people. Because most of the people, when you start talking about it, and I guess it's already happening in your head now, you're saying, hey, but how do you do the salaries? Now, does it mean that everybody has exactly the same salary? Well, no, not really. Because we actually decouple them. And once you say your salary has nothing to do with your position, then no one actually missed those. Because they doesn't matter. Plus, they don't tell you what to do because in agile environment, we collaborate, we do whatever it takes to achieve that value. I'm not a developer anymore, of course, run practice, but I am just a development team member and I might do testing today and documentation tomorrow and coding the day after. Or I might be coding the entire sprint depending what is the team need. So, positions, right? So, if you can't get rid of them, just make them less steep and less ridiculous, I would say. And also, let's narrow down, like Scrum is doing, right? We don't have developers, testers, unless we just have development team members. So make them wider by specification and not their team. And it goes back to the motivation somehow. So bonuses and evaluation. So, um, how do we even deal with them? Well, different thing. I can only show what we did. We sell, we keep the level wherever the people are, we correct some of those cases who's been really completely off, and the rest we just fix somehow. When somebody came to us, they have to come up with a business case. I believe I deliver more value to the cat to the company now. Because I'm better at coaching and look at those teams, how they are growing now. Okay, sounds reasonable. Or I believe I write a much better code than I used to and you know, I don't need those senior guys to stay by me all the time. So I believe, right? It's kind of a business case of value. And also it's always supported by the regular peer review, right? Like saying, Hey, okay, so let's have a look at what your peers are saying about you on a scale from 1 to 10. How will you say your colleague or each of your colleagues are good at technical skills, good at analytical skills, good at uh, soft skills or whatever question you feel is important to ask, but don't ask too many. We ask four quadrants. And we also ask those same quadrants to individuals, like where do you see yourself and why? And what would need to change so you would be one or two steps ahead? And that was a very interesting conversation because it was not evaluation anymore, it was a coaching conversation focused on their development. You never say, no, you are not five, you are four. So okay, that's interesting, so you see yourself five. So who do you think, who do you compare to? Like, do you have any team members or uh, from the other teams people who feel you're there at the same level? And how do you know that you are two steps ahead? And if they were able to say it, that was exactly what you need to have this conversation about the people development. So, forget about bonuses, money demotivates if you don't have enough. They don't motivate if you give more and more and more. Once you reach that enough level, you back off. It doesn't matter anymore. So we call them demotivating factor because they can only demotivate if you feel underpaid, but can't really make you super enthusiastic about your work. Tons of research on that, I don't know. Annual KPIs, like you know what happened to us? First of all, people hate it, they've been afraid of it. Second of all, whenever we were just about to talk about myself, about my KPIs, then later on, you know, KPIs of some of my employees, it's like, okay, so you have there those five points. This one is irrelevant. 
that one doesn't make sense anymore, etc., etc., etc. So how should we evaluate? Hey, we give you 100% because you're doing a good job. But that's what we did. And that was actually a good excuse for get rid of it. So we just remove all those KPIs and things and we said what we are doing is driven by the product owner, by the patient, right? And things like that. If you work on a good manner, well, first of all, we have the Scrum Master who takes care of it. We have this retrospective as a regular feedback cycles. And we do also this peer feedback time to time on those four quadrants so we know. Not a big deal. Right? Now, so which practices are useful? At the end of the day, start with purpose. And that's something which people are not patient enough. They often feel like, yeah, yeah, but that's somebody else's job. I've seen that presentation. It's in that, you know, screen or on that logo somewhere. Mm -mm. Not enough. You have to go back and say, why should we change at all? Why can't we work the same way as we always did? Why do we do this agile in the first place? It's our dream. And if we can say it, and let every random person in the company say it as well, the similar words, not same, but a similar kind of things. I don't think any agile will not work. And I don't think any of those flowing practices would really help you. Start with why. That's your star on the horizon. If you don't have it, you could always just mess. And another one is servant leadership. Because that's the enabler for the flat structure. I was mentioning the steel organization, right? It's based on purpose. <coughs> High important evolutionary purpose. But it's also driven by not managers anymore. They would say they don't have managers, but they do have leaders. So what's the difference? Manager is a position you have those stars, you know, you're important. You can be promoted to be a manager. Leadership, on the contrary, is state of mind. Am I willing to take this bold step forward and make some action? Am I willing to organize a workshop around this lack of quality focus? Do I care enough? Or would I just better say, you know, what would they really tell me I do it? Right? This emergent leadership is exactly what we need. And then, in order to grow it, you need this servant leadership. Are you familiar with this concept? All of you? It's coming from church, which is a little here. And I don't like that name, because it shows like you're serving someone. It's hierarchical, that name. But actually, when you read about it, that's exactly what enables that flat structure, because your ultimate goal as a servant leader is to help others to become leaders, not managers, not the efficient, but leaders who knows the purpose, who understands the vision, who can come up with their own ideas and say, hey, I think we should do this. And then wait for the feedback from the crowd. And by the way, if they want to join, well, then most likely it was a good idea, a good experiment. In Agile, we don't do just the best practices. By the way, there is nothing like best practice exists in Agile world. We do experiments. And some of those experiments are likely to succeed, and some of those unlikely. But there is no such thing as, you know, you eat this pill and you're going to be agile. Or you follow this process and you're gonna, it's going to work. It just doesn't exist. It's a context specific. Like on a C, right? You have some ideas, like, is it generally a bad idea? I just don't do it. But in other words, it doesn't say anything. And this is usually a good idea, you know? Those um, have this person 
watching for the rocks, does it save you from failing and reaching some of those rocks? Not really. So, servant leadership, help others to grow, help the whole things to be emergent and support this um, self-organization, right? Now, once you start speaking about it, and uh, like very hierarchical organizations say, no, 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 I don't really understand it. Like, who is responsible? Yeah, um, um, you can stop there. There is like no way you can explain it at that moment anyway. So all you need to do is to take a couple steps back and say, okay, so they're not there yet. That's okay. They are somewhere mentally here. It's a very hierarchical structure. So maybe my approach should be more still aligned with their current culture and reality. So I would not speak about tea organization, for example, that kind of, just to give you an example. I would not speak about this either. But at the end of the day, that's exactly what we need to grow as an HR in the organization. How? Well, soft skill trainings, maybe, we can start. Leadership kind of academies as now it starts to be really popular like those big corporations are running those leadership agile leadership academy they usually call it and they fly like everyone from all those branches somewhere and they usually ask like can you give us a talk on like uh, three hours on agile whatever leadership or something and i say i guess i can but are you sure that's exactly what you need because I think they don't going to really change that much. They say, yeah, yeah, they have a lot of other things. It's okay, no problem. I'll just give you a talk. Not a big deal. But I don't think that's enough. So it's a good intention, but it must be more intensive because you're really changing this approach. Anyway, good start. Ongoing purities. So when I say ongoing, I really mean day to day. There is no specific meeting or every Friday you ask every of your team members. Just kind of natural, whenever is needed, at least, by the way, every retrospective. We have a chance to talk about it. We have a scrum master who is looking into those things and helping the teams to start a conversation when they need to. It's really ongoing. I always say when I help our teams to grow into that space, I'm telling them that I don't want to learn at our quarter conversation about their growth, about any issue. From their peers, I want to get five plus numbers on a scale, you know, zero to ten. Why five plus? Because we say if you're five, that was the guideline around it, that means you work fine. There are no issues with you, no, it's a good job. Five, six is a good job. Four means like, yeah, there are some issues. Three means like, hey, come on, what the hell are you doing here in this company, right, etc. So I say, I don't wanna see anything lower than five quarterly. I wanna actually hear about you as a team solving it with that team member. It could be driven by Scrum Master initially, but eventually as a team, you're responsible for helping your peers to grow. And I want to know about it, and I want to help you at the end of the day to solve it if you are failing to help that person. We might give him a specific coaching, we might give him a mentor, we might sponsor a class for that person, whatever is needed. But actually, we say those issues need to be solved in real time. So they are not surprised at this growing conversation because you don't want to have a evaluation. Well, yeah, that's great, you are growing, but you know we are actually unhappy with you. It doesn't fit there, right? So deliver feedback on time. We have this uh, habit with one of those leadership teams who's been those four executives who's been having this trouble to say no to people and say anything, even tiny negative to them. So as a result, in that company, they've got many products running, which they've been paying for like no profit at all, not even visible. And they've been still sponsoring them because they've been afraid to say no 
It was nice for the owners, you know. They would have to look into their eyes and say, no, sorry, we believe your nice, wonderful, brilliant idea just sucks. We stop it, right? And they were not brave enough to do that. They didn't have that courage. So what I teach them eventually was like, how about if you have those regular feedbacks? This person, all the product owners will be coming to you every two weeks, right? Having a short overview of what's going on in those projects because you say they are critical now. So if those three are critical out of 20 in the product uh, company, you need to focus, right? I say yes, okay. And I also said at the end, once you discuss whatever you want to say, then you give them a feedback. It's a very simple one. That means I'm super happy about whatever is happening there. I'm completely unhappy. Right? Anything you And I ran the first review with actually one of them, which is kind of funny. He's been running his products. He is one of those owners, four owners of the company. He's running this product for like three years. They've been super unhappy, but they never told him. So their feedback, first time into their eyes, was like two, three, one. And he was sitting there, like really like this, saying like, and not speaking, really, like looking at them. This is amazing. And then when they say, well, I, uh, so, uh, I know it might be hard. It's like, no, no, it's okay if you feel that way. I'm glad. I at least know it. But I don't get it. Why didn't you tell me earlier? Because I've been living all those years in this feeling that you actually feel my product is good. Those others are not. But mine was okay. And that was like a new surprise. And I still remember that. So this feedback, this honest feedback, when you have to do it on time as a regular thing, with any fancy little stuff. Hey, how do you feel? Right? I started with another team who is doing this round robin thing. We have a conversation and we are very often not close it somehow, right? And move on, so I said, okay, so how do you feel? Can we do the round robin after every topic? This means, yes, I'm satisfied with the conversation, whatever. This means, so, so, then we want to hear in one sentence why. This means, no, and we definitely want to hear why. Right? And that actually improved our ability to give a feedback to the executives quite uh, tremendously. Because finally, everybody speaks up and say it, and it was like, so visible. I've been complaining during the time, but actually I'm good now. It's sorted out for me, and I've been complaining, and I'm sure still missing focus, for example. Right? You make it really brief. But that's important. So, peer review, feedback. And of course, you need to have a high level of trust. So with that team, where we do this run from it now, by the way, to tell you, two years ago, there was a team with no trust. So when you show up there, people would never, ever say even with which eyes because they are afraid of conflict, they don't trust each other. You know, last time I said something in front of their team, etc. And we've been working on that trust. What we did, well, try to become more team, try to talk, try to facilitate better our conversations, by the way. But we also invested heavily into our team buildings. Very often we decided to pay the team building fun activity ourselves, not let the company pay for that. But it's still a good team building. You can do it, you don't need to ask anybody's permission. But this team felt the need to solve this trust issue. So they work on it. So that was very interesting. And if you don't have that trust, fix that first, right? You can start this feedback like, Hey, no, we are all great. Say each other that you hate each other. <laughs> Not really, right? So it has always the context. System coaching. That's something which is not that well known in the world, I would say, in general. If you go to coaching schools, like uh, you find all those different uh, frameworks, etc., they mostly help you to understand how to coach individuals. There are very few who are teaching how to coach systems and teams. 
I've been lucky enough I could recommend it into one of those, which is Organizational Relationship System Coaching, ORSC. And it was a game changer for me. But anyway, system coaching is different because you work with organizations, you work with relationships, you work with teams. And that's actually quite useful in Agile at the organizational level. Sometimes people are asking, what are you doing if you have thousands of employees? Well, that's a tool which I'm using. So, think about it. There would be more than just ORS, Organizational Relationship System Coaching things. But, it's useful. Do you believe the flotilla of a small boat can reach to a certain goal? Or do you believe it must be a huge tanker boat? Right? If you ask this question this way, most of the people would say, the flotilla is just fine. It's more flexible, it's okay. They have to understand the mission, but yes, they can do it. Now, if you rephrase it, do you believe that those teams can be decentralized and you don't really, you know, need to have a central meeting to drive things? Most of the organizations would say no. So where is this disconnect, right? With the boats, it's possible, with organizations, it's not. But it's really the same thing. Do you have that purpose or not? Is it clear enough or not? A couple more few things. So open space. That's one of my favorite techniques. I remember, I don't know, 10 years ago when I happened to be, maybe 15 years ago, where I happened to be on my first open space. I hated it. I was like, I don't get it. You know, those people are talking about things and I don't know why and uh, what shall I ever do and it's weird. So, what is open space? It's a very interesting and very agile practice which helps people to kind of self-organize over a topics and talk about them and then share back whatever the results are from their conversation. So, how we start, we usually start with this market space as we call it, right? We have the amount of people like the whole company invited, not attending by the way, but it's voluntary based, inclusive. So you say, hey, our next open space, we are going to talk about how should we redesign our office space, right? That was one of our things, we read it. How should we redesign our office space? And then those people show up, they have this big topic in mind, whoever cares about it, they show up, whoever doesn't, they continue their work. And then they brainstorm those topics, right? So you have a papers and sharpies, and you have this board over there saying like we have four spaces in this particular picture. Space marked as a tree, mushroom, sun, and a cloud. You can come up with more better, you know, names. It was just hard to draw. And then you move those post-it notes next to your time slot, which is the other X, right? And the space. So for example, the first yellow one in the mushroom is starting first with the first time slot. And then you say, hey, I want to talk about game area. And I want to talk about lunch area. And I want to talk about the noise, right? Things like that. And then make it visible on those post-its. And then people look at that whole board and say, where do I want to go? Because you don't have to suggest your own topic. You just and say, hey, I'm interested about lunch and noise, so I'm joining those too. And then I might disappear even. So once you're done, you split into those spaces, right? You have those spaces identified by those, you know, mushrooms, etc. And you have a person who suggested that topic, usually coming to that space and saying, Okay, so here is our topic, how to improve our dining experience. And there are a few things, like law of two feet, which is very interesting and important, which says, if you don't like whatever is happening in there, just use your two feet. <laughs> My God, very simple. You don't have to say anything, you don't have to feel bad. 
He just feels, oh, I thought it's gonna be about cuisine, and then it's actually about the tables. No, right? Anyway. Now, there are those two butterflies and bumblebees. Yeah, to tell you the truth, I'm always mixing those two. So one of them is that you're flying around and listening for a while over here and over there. And you know, you might bring, that's I think the bumblebee, right? And you might be bringing some ideas from lunch conversation, for the space conversation, etc. right? If it's interesting, you might stay. But if it's not that interesting, you might just see what is happening. And the other one, and I believe that's the butterfly, that this one will be sitting somewhere in a hall and like an empty space and digesting whatever he hear before. And then some other people like that show up there and they might start a conversation or not, just processing. So everything you decide to do there is okay. It's has those crazy names, I think, because we want to unleash the creativity of people. We want to show them, hey, it's okay to be weird. And we would never do set up like that on an open space, right? With those school tables, right? So part of it is really make it open, make it crazy, make it different. I remember at one conference where we want to make it happen, it was in Poland in Krakow, the ACE conference. Paul Clip asked the speakers, can you explain the open space for me? And somebody said yes. And then somebody got this idea, can we do the role play? We do the theater kind of thing. And we'll be like, uh, really showing them how it's gonna look like. So I remember with one of the things, I've been playing that butterfly and kind of moving around. So let's start my emotional kind of linkage to this format. But I start liking it and using it much later than that, by the way. Even that play doesn't make me shift my mind and understand this concept. But it for how you can use it? For pretty much anything. How to redesign our space. How, uh, what could be our next team building about? How can we improve the quality of our products? How can we improve overall company agility? Anything. The thing is, if the item or the topic is not important for the people, no one shows up, or very few people shows up, and that's okay. You got your message. No one cares. Time's good. If you have the full room, like they can't even move, well, that was an issue. So maybe we better spend more time. So once you finish this conversation, you usually create a flip chart summary, and then we start as a marketplace, marketplace, and we finish with similar thing summary. Hey, we talked about this lunch, and we've been covering those things, and we thought we might go and ask the other companies about which you know catering vendor is uh, usually good, and we might try to change it because you know the contract is just finishing or we might actually try to find out if there are not some food trucks which would be willing to have a stop in front of our office right it could be any crazy or not crazy thing you share it and then of course the person who organized it in this case most likely hr would make a notes and would be part of those conversations listening and then you might take the next step and say, okay, we do additional thing, we do those work cafes on top, we run a community, or we do something else. Education, coaching, facilitation, right? It's just a one data point, giving you the system perspective. But that's pretty much what is it all about. Create a strategic, value-driven culture, focus on employee experience, right? Three points towards the top. Just a summary. Focus on employee experience. No rules, processes, anything. Go to the organization towards the evolutionary purpose. Because that's the glue. If you don't have it, nothing which I've been speaking about in our work, anyway. 
create a collaborative culture. You are the culture builders. You can do much more than your teams can. You are too busy focusing on the work. Help them. And at the end of the day, Agile HR is Agile leadership, system coaching, and large group facilitation. That's it. So maybe you just go ahead and start educating your HR at your companies or yourself and your colleagues in those three domains. Maybe that's the first stuff you can do. This is the book I wrote. It's called The Great Scrum Master. And you can get it from Amazon. And you can connect with me. Thank you very much. to start this practice in an organization. So we don't do it, when we run this open space for Agile Prior Conference, then we don't give that topic. We just say, hey, whatever topic is good. But when I would run it for organization, as a beginning, I would always have a topic. And maybe six months after or a year after, when everybody has been used to this practice, I will remove it. And if there are too many topics, Dysfunctional teams, I would not do it. And right? 
how do you still support the Scrum Master or you? I mean, or the Scrum Master is basically in charge of developing the people or the team members or how do you think? In a way, Scrum Master is a servant leader, yeah. so Scrum Master is in charge of developing people. I would not say Scrum Master is in charge of hiring, but I would invite Scrum Master together with a team, I mean the broader team, for interview, mm -hmm. if they feel that way. Okay. Alright, lunch, I guess. <laughs> Thank you.